Hello students, welcome to the third video in the circular motion series. In this video, we're going to work out questions four and five from the University of Zambia PHY 1015 to the ratio six. So the concepts we're going to work out will be based on uh, the introduction video that we made. So if you, you are still struggling with these ideas, so you can quickly just go back and try to, uh, to watch that video if you haven't seen it yet. So we're still using just the basics of uh, circular motion. We are yet to, to look at uh, concepts like inertia, moment of, moment of inertia, uh, and so on. So uh, I, I assume you've, uh, you've had time to, to go through the video, the, 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 the question. If you haven't, you can just pause the video and try it out. So you, you've tried the question out, and then now we just want to look at uh, how to work it out. So this is question four. It is similar to uh, question three from the previous video in this series. Uh, so it's still a conical pendulum with only very few differences. So in this question now, um, among the differences uh, between this and the previous one. So in the previous question, uh, we had the same, the same concept. So this is still uh, a conical pendulum. So we are still asking, uh, the question is still asking for an object that goes in a circular manner, uh, horizontal to a reference frame. So circular manner, horizontal to a reference frame. There you go. So, but the, the difference is in the previous question, uh, we were asked to find this angle theta. So it was the angle that uh, the code made with the vertical. Uh, but in this question, what we're looking for is the angle the code makes with the horizontal, which is this one. So let's call it alpha. So now in this case, to find this, um, uh, I think one other difference that I need to point out before we, we go we go further is in the previous question, we were given the value of the length of the code. That was given at about uh, 30 centimeters. So again, if you haven't seen that video, uh, if you haven't seen uh, the question I keep referring to, I'll leave the description to that. I'll, I'll leave a link to that in the description below. So we're given the length of the code and then we had to, to get uh, the radius in form of that, uh, that length. But for this question, we are actually given the radius itself. So, if we just go through what this question gives us, they tell us the mass of the of the bob of the ball that is given as four fifty grams. Apart from this, uh, they are also telling us to say we have a radius. This is one point two five meters, and then next up, we're being given the tangential velocity, uh, which is the velocity this uh, tangential velocity uh, the the mass is 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 moving with going around and that is given to us as 8.5 meters per second. Um, yeah, and then now the first step, they're saying, what is the tension in the code? And then apart from that, the angle it makes with the horizontal. So just like we did in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, uh, video uh, on question three, that is, uh, you have to look at first the forces that are acting on this. So, um, just use a different color. So if you have uh, an object like this, uh, do it smaller, if an object like this. So if this is our mass, and then this mass is being pulled in this direction as our, by our stream. So this is the direction of the tension. So this is just a vector. So since tension is practically a force, it is a force. So we just have to resolve it. So we want to work uh, with this tension using this angle um, alpha. So I want to use this angle alpha. So basically what happens is this um, makes a right angle this side. So in terms of resolving, we need to get the tension in the X. And then apart from that, it also gives us the tension in the Y. So this will be the same as this one here. So what we realize from there is that we can easily use sine to give us ty and we can use cos to give us tx. 
So if we use the, um, the, the, the sine and cosine ratios, we know that sine alpha is equals to uh, opposite, which is ty over, uh, over t itself. This is t here. So let me write it from the side. So that is t. So ty over t over t, implying that t is equals to t sine alpha. So this is ty. And then if we want to get the component in the x, so we know that cos alpha is equals to adjacent t x over uh, t itself. So it's adjacent over hypotenuse. So from there, from there, what we're going to have is tx is equals to t and then cos alpha. Now, what we want to see um, for this object, uh, the idea I was trying to bring earlier on, we want to identify all the forces that are acting on this object. So what we see is that uh, we have a component of the tension going up, that's ty, and then we have a component of the tension that is going towards the center, that is dx. And then apart from this, we also have the weight of the ball that is going down. So this, we're calling it mg. So that is the weight of the ball. Now, again, since this is rotating, that force, that component of the tension that is going towards the center, that must be the one that gives us the centripetal force. So again, I think we did explain that in the previous video. So we'll just go right ahead and use that. So we're saying the X component of the tension uh, gives us the centripetal force. So from here, what we see is TX, we did have its expression, that's T cos alpha. This is equals to, so you should remember that centripetal force FC is given by MVT squared over R. So when we substitute this here, what we have is M, vt squared over r. So this becomes our equation, our equation one. So from here now, so we got this by looking at the forces in the x. Now we have to look at what happens in the y. So if we go back to our diagram, in the y we have ty going up and mg going down. So what that means is, in Newton's second law, the sum of forces in the y, this gives us ty positive, and then plus mg is going down, so this is going to be minus. But since the object or the boy is not moving vertically, so this gives us zero. So in the end, all we're saying is ty is equals to mg. So again, the expression for ty, if we were to go back up, so we saw earlier on that um, ty is equals to t sine alpha. So that was ty, t sine alpha. So if we get that and substitute it back here, so we get t sine alpha is equals to mg. So let's get this as our equation two. Now, if you look uh, closely at equation one and equation two, they're kind of related. What you want to do is you want to work out these two equations simultaneously. So you want to find the easiest way to work them out. There are a number of ways that you can do that. Um, my, my method or the approach that I'm going to take, I'm going to divide um, we divide equation one into equation two. So I'm going to divide equation one into equation two. So this approach, I'm going to use the left-hand side. We'll divide into the left-hand side of equation two. So I'm going to divide cos t cos alpha into t sine alpha. I'm doing this specifically because I, I observe just by cross inspection that I'm going to have t sine alpha over t cos alpha. This is going to eliminate the t's and I'm going to remove sine alpha over cos alpha. And that is going to give me tan. So an alternative way you can do this is you can just make t the subject of the formula in one of the equation 
and then substitute it in the in the other in the other equation. Just work it out using elimination if you're finding my method a little bit uh, tricky. So if I if I use my method, I'm saying um, the left hand side of equation two is t sine alpha divided by the left hand side of equation one, which is t equation one. That's t cos alpha. And then the right hand side of uh, the right hand side of equation one, equation two. I mean that is mg. And the right hand side of equation two, that is m uh, of equation one, that is m vt squared over r. So if you change this, uh, what happens is you now have mg multiplying r over m vt squared. So I've just change the division here into multiplication. And then the right hand side becomes um, mgr over vt squared m. So the masses cancel out. On the left hand side, I have t sine alpha over t cos alpha. The t cancels out. And what I mean with is sine alpha over cos alpha which is tan. So I mean with tan alpha equals to gr over vt squared. So I want to get alpha only. So this is going to be alpha is equals to, so this is going to be alpha is equals to, and then this is going to be tan inverse of, so it's going to be tan inverse of uh, this entire lot. So I'm going to substitute g is 9.8, times the radius was given to us as 1.25. And then this is over the tangential velocity, that's 8.5 squared. So if you worked this one out, you expect to get the exact answer of the angle as 9.62 degrees. Okay. So the next part would be to find um, to find the tension t. So you can pick any one of the equations. I'm going to pick the, the easiest. I'm going to pick equation now, uh, equation two. So from equation two, what you have is t uh, sine alpha is equals to mg. So from here, what you're saying is t is equals to mg over sine alpha. So this is M, the mass is given to us as a 450 grams. So that is 0 0.4 kgs multiplying 9.8 divided by sine alpha. So alpha is 9.62 degrees. So if you did this, you expect to get 26.4 newtons. Okay, so this, uh, this was question four. So I can quickly move on to uh, the question five. Okay, so for question five, uh, we're looking at a wheel of a given radius um, that has a certain number of, uh, of spokes. So what we have to notice is uh, they're saying it has eight spokes. So if this wheel has eight spokes, so basically what they're saying is uh, if you had it something like this, and then if you had to demarcate it into eight sections. Okay, so if you cut this into eight, to add the eight spokes, so if you had to count this, there are eight. So now uh, the concept here is you want to shoot an arrow into one of them. So as the arrow goes there, you want the arrow to go in and then come out from the other side before the next spoke reaches it. That's what we're looking for now. The question is, what is the velocity of the wheel just to allow for that? What must be the velocity of the wheel just to allow the arrow to, uh, uh, to, pass, to pass right through? So one way you can look at it is when one spoke passes, just as the first spoke passes, the arrow reaches here. It starts its journey. Now you want the full length of the arrow to occur the other side by the time the next spoke comes. So in other words, the whole length of the arrow must pass. 
So what we have to do first of all is we need to know how long can it take the arrow to travel its, its total length. So the question does give us uh, uh, the, the velocity of the arrow. The velocity of the arrow is given to us as six meters per second. So we get that, that is six meters per second. Apart from that, they're also telling us um, the length of the arrow. So the length of the arrow is given to us as 20, uh, 20 centimeters. So uh, the length of the arrow, let's call it X, that is 20 centimeters. So the length of the arrow is um, 20 centimeters. This is basically just uh, 0 0.2 meters. Now with this, what we want to know is, okay, how long does it take, can it take an arrow to travel its entire length? We want to know the time. So since it's moving with constant velocity, we're going to use speed or velocity is equals to uh, displacement over time. So when we make t the subject of the formula, this becomes t is equals to uh, the distance over uh, the, the speed. So this becomes the distance is its length, which is 0 0.2 meters divided by the velocity, which is six meters. And if you did that, what you get as the time is going to be 0 0.033 seconds. Okay, now having done this, you see, while well, the, the wheel is going through this, what we notice is, uh, while, while the arrow is uh, was, was moving at this velocity and uh, for this situation, what the wheel has to do is to rotate through this angle. It has to rotate through this angle. Now the question is, what is this angle? So the wheel has to rotate through this angle. It has to move from here up to here. The question is, what is this angle? So what I have to do then is, okay, a full rotation or the whole wheel has um, a total angle of two pi, that is in radians. So now we want to divide this two pi into eight sections. What this will give us is the angle of each section, which would be the, the theta that we are looking for the angular displacement, uh, the spoke, uh, the second spoke would have um, covered before as into where the, the arrow is passing. Now, if we did that, if we divided this, what we get is going to be in rad. So uh, this basically just gives us the, the angle or the angular displacement of uh, between two consecutive spokes. So if we work this one out, you get one over four pi uh, rad, in decimals, this is going to be 0. Um, that's 0 0.785, 0 0.785 rad. Okay, now having done this, the next thing would be, okay, now what is going to be the angular velocity of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the wheel? If it covers a distance, an angular distance of theta in a time t, so I'm using the same equation I, I, I would use in linear motion. The difference being that now I'm dealing with angular motion. So I, I'm using, it's practically this equation, but now I'm using it in uh, circular motion. So I'm using an angular displacement divided by time. What I'm getting is an angular velocity. So if you did that, what you'd have is the 0 0.785, the angular displacement, divided by the time 0 0.033 seconds. And when you divide this, you get exactly 23.79 rads per second. So you get 23.79 rads per second. So this becomes the angular velocity um, of our wheel. Now, the question was asking for two things. So if you just go back to the question, so the question was saying, um, yeah, calculate the maximum velocity of the wheel, maximum value of uh, our omega, um, and then not really on, yeah, calculate the angular velocity uh, of, of the wheel in rods per second and in revolutions per second. So there are two ways you can work about, you can go about this. You can either just convert this to revolutions per second 
or you can just convert this angle. You see, get the angle between two consecutive spokes in revolutions. Here we got it in radians. Get it in revolutions. And to do that, of course, you know to say a full rotation makes one revolution. Divide one by eight. And if you did this, what you get is going to be the same um, angle, the same angle for one, but in revolutions. So if you actually work this one out, it gets 0 0.125 revolutions as the angle between two consecutive spokes. And if you worked what if you worked it out in this formula now, since it's still the same time, so if you work this one out, now you're going to have 0 0.125 revs divided by 0 0.33. The answer you'd get here is going to be the same velocity, the same angular velocity, but now in revolutions per second, which comes out as 3.79 revolutions per second. So you can try to just convert this directly to revolutions per, per second. It will, it will still give you the same value. Okay. Now, the last part of the question was asking us uh, uh, for something that we just have to kind of think uh, think about. I say, um, yeah, does it matter where between the, the axle and the rim of the wheel you aim? Does it really matter? As in, would, would it be different if you aimed there, as in close to the to the edges of the of the rim or close to the uh, to, to the pivot where it is rotating about? Would it really matter? The answer there is no. It doesn't matter. Why? It's because if you look at our expression, really, uh, the position where it is uh, doesn't really affect much. Uh, or one way that you can look at uh, all that, that that appears here to, to give our our velocity. If you look at our, our, our formula, the formula that we used here to determine the the angular velocity, all that, that we have to think about is the angular displacement the spoke has to has to cover. And if you look at two consecutive spokes, like if this was the first one and this is the next one, whether you are somewhere here or you're somewhere here or you're somewhere here. The angle that um, you have to think about, the angle that you have to work with is still the same. The only difference is we, uh, we, have, to, we have to say that um, the arrow is short just as the first spoke passes, just close as it passes, so that this next, um, the next spoke, it has to cover this same angle, the same angle. So the theta here is going to be the same, whether you fire it from close to the pivot or somewhere a little bit further or somewhere a little bit further. So it doesn't matter where you, you shoot it from. As long as you just aim immediately after the first spoke passes, it doesn't matter where you aim aiming from there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's question, uh, question three, and question four and question five from tutorial sheet six. So I hope um, you, you found this, um, this video helpful. If you did, um, drop a like or something or, yeah. And if you don't want to miss some of my next videos, just subscribe and hit the notification bell so that uh, every time when I upload something, you will be notified by YouTube. Now, right, I hope uh, this was helpful for any, 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 any points that you need me to clarify on. You can get in touch with me with, uh, in the, using the email in the description below. I'll leave a link um, to, to my previous video as well, just in case you need to go through that. Um, yeah, otherwise you can still also request for, for the document where I'm performing all the calculations. All right, otherwise all the best.